to go through those and then take questions at the end if that's okay. So, um, yeah, I wanted to start off by, uh, so I'm a research ecologist with USGS. I've been working on grizzly bears in the system for about 15 years. Um, I started working on them in conjunction with Kate Kendall, who's my predecessor. She's now retired. And so I uh, uh, took over her job about two years ago. She's still working on, uh, in, a, in a retired sort of emeritus status, and, and we're working together on some other projects with that as well. Um, so she's part, a big part of, of all of this work, and I, I just want to make sure acknowledge her in addition to, of course, uh, me. And there's a lot of other people too, but um, we'll, we'll start with that for now. Let's see if this works. Do I have to turn it on? I have to turn more again. Let's see. Thank you. 
that the hair sticks in there in the barb and then we are able to take a sample that way. The other way we sampled, oh this is the, um, so this is the results from 2004 which is the first year that we sampled the entire system and the only year, year that we sampled the entire system using this method. Um, and so we ended up with uh, just under 21,000 different bear hair samples and uh, that was a lot of processing. So um, this is a really big big study obviously that I'm talking about. We also sampled with a second method and we call those bear rub surveys and you might have seen this on YouTube set to some pretty fantastic music. Um, but basically these are out um, naturally in the wild and they, bears naturally rub on these trees. Um, that's a little black bear there going crazy. Uh, a 
population of animals is more able to adapt to any change that might happen that way. So, um, yeah, so we, uh, when I came on, one of the things that we were looking, thinking about was, okay, so we know a little bit about the diversity of the whole system. You can take one big number. But I'm really interested in spatial patterns and processes across, like, whole, big, large landscapes like this one. And so I said, okay, well, maybe we should uh, try to calculate that so we know how it varies across this landscape. And so um, across all of those studies that I just talked about, we have a, a, over a thousand different individual pairs that we have genotypes for, and over 6,000 detections. Um, and of those, there's about just under 600 females and a little over 500 uh, males. And so we took all of that data, and these are just the centroids of all those places where we found those bears, and the little black dots. And then we said, okay, well, what is the diversity within these kind of circles that are around each individual? So how diverse is it? And then we made some maps. So um, this is a map of the genetic diversity when we first started sampling the whole system in 2004. And what we see is that uh, up in Glacier Park, um, in the northern part of the system, or basically the whole northern part of the system, we have relatively high diversity. That's kind of in the yellow. And um, that's kind of what we would expect because we know that there were quite a few bears there. Uh, what we thought was going on before was that because the population got so low, there might have been these sort of semi-isolated groups of bears. And when that happens, when you have smaller groups of animals, you can actually have uh, genetic diversity go down. Um, but nobody had looked at this before, and nobody had even uh, really kind of considered doing this. And so we did that. And um, we found that there were some, there was a signal of lower genetic diversity in the southern part of the system. Um, so um, kind of interchangeably might call the southwest part of the missions um, and the southeast part the scapegoat. Um, and then there's the east central around that side. But basically, those areas had lower genetic diversity than we saw in Glacier Park. But we have this really long-term data set. So um, we said, well, what happens? And what we saw is that it actually increased in those parts of the system extremely rapidly uh, between uh, 2004 and 2012. So that's only eight years. And a grizzly bear can live you know, 35 years in the wild. Um, so that's really fast. So, that, so we consider um, a generation kind of like eight years. And so that's kind of like what on average is the length of time between when a bear is born and it has an offspring like an offspring that lives. Uh, so, so this is really fast, and this is also really good news. So we see this big increase in genetic diversity, and that's um, what you would want to see if a population is growing and recovering, which is what we think is happening. And so that was cool. That's really cool, actually. That's really good news for this population. But it also raised all kinds of other questions. Um, and it brought me back to this family tree um, that I wanted to create to look at dispersal and look at other questions. Um, and so as between the time when I started thinking about this like, I don't know, 10 years ago, and and now the methods to, uh, to do family trees have really uh, improved a lot. And so uh, we tried it again. And this time it worked really well. Um, we have a lot of confidence in our results. It's still a model, um, but uh, we have a lot of confidence in it. So um, I tell you that because we're going to dive in, in a little bit and we're going to look at some of these really cool relationships between individuals. Um, but I want you to remember that um, in some level, at some level, the stuff that we're showing you is preliminary because uh, if we do another version of it as we add more bears in, which we're currently doing, um, the results might change a little bit. So we have overall a high level of confidence, but um, if they change in two years, be forgiving. <laughs> okay, so when we did this uh, family tree, what we found is that we had um, 435 triads, so that's what that means is we know both the mom and the dad with pretty high confidence. And this is really incredible. So uh, if you think about, well, I can't read my 
no family tree back that far <laughs> with that many relatives on there, even though I have, uh, my cousins are Catholic and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> definitely uh, contributing to a lot of am uh, individuals to our human gene pool. Um, but, th but this is really amazing. So when you think about a dispersal data set and trying to understand what's going on with dispersal of any kind of species, having 435 dispersals is really amazing. Um, so these triads are the ones that we have the highest level of confidence in. Um, and so that's, I'm, I was very, very excited about that. And so from that family tree, we can get a lot of different pieces of information. So one of the first things we can get uh, is just looking at how many how many babies did bears have, you know, how many offspring. And um, there's quite a few. So on the right side, we have females. And we can see that the maximum number of, uh, and this is just what we detected um, and that we're assigned in our model, but we detect some females having as many as 10 different offspring. Um, and we detect one male who has 17 offspring. Um, and so those are some pretty big uh, productive individuals. Sorry, this is over the course of the parent's lifetime? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Um, so she asked whether it's over the course of the parent's lifetime, and it's a little hard to know that because we're sampling across time, and bears can live a really long time. And so this is kind of, I wouldn't say this is lifetime reproductive success, is, that's sort of the technical term for it, but it's kind of a, a, a sampling across time. So some of them might, only, some of the individuals in our sample are probably only eight, um, some of them might be two, um, but we also probably have individuals that are 35. So um, yeah, so it's a little bit of a mishmash, but this is actually the best information that's out there on, I think, any bear population that I know of. So, um, so they also have a large number of mates. Um, so this is, again, just the successful, the, the, the breeding pairs that were successful um, that we detected. They lived long enough for us to detect their babies. Um, so we know that in, with, for both males and females, we have um, seven mates each. So those are very, um, not exactly uh, monotonous. <laughs> And then because we're interested in these spatial patterns, we took and made, we went ahead and made a map of that too. And what we see, and this is actually really important in terms of management, is we see that in the northern part of the system where we have higher diversity and we also have higher density, um, particularly in 2004, um, that uh, there's plenty, there's sort of a, a, a moderate number of offspring on average per adult. It's more in the neighborhood of one or two. You know, again, this is not necessarily their full number of babies that they have in their lifetime, but just um, that we were able to detect. And then, um, but as you move further south, you see that number go way up. And so basically where there's lower density, there's more offspring per adult. So that's a, an interesting effect and it, and it kind of matters for um, thinking about um, what should you be managing for in terms of populations into the future. So what it suggests is if you want to keep a high level of diversity, um, you want to keep lots of individuals contributing to the gene pool, you might want to manage for a certain, level, a certain density of bears, a certain average density of bears. Uh, oh, I forgot about this. This is a picture, actually, of the family tree. Um, it's about 25 feet long, and um, it's too little to see it, uh, but that's also why it's kind of hard to talk about it. So um, I'm really excited that Nate's going to dive in and show you some cool parts of this family tree, um, I think, now. Is now the next time? All right, here we go. All right, yeah, so that's super long and it's like the size of a font. And all the scribbles you see on there are actually bears connected to each other uh, by lines and, and matings and such. Um, looks like uh, Gregory might have, might have drawn that. Um, and so, like Deb said, we are, oops, sorry, we are going to delve into just a little piece because it's impossible to really look into a family tree of a thousand bears. It, you just can't. 
can't comprehend it. Um, this is really fun for me because I don't get to look at these, these smaller pieces uh, very often. So we looked at this one here. Uh, this is Bluto's family tree. Bluto is uh, that bear that has 17 offspring um, and seven mates. Uh, and this is small once again, but on the top you have Bluto with all the lines coming off of them um, and seven different mates. And I'll, I'll break this down a little bit more. This is a pretty complicated family tree compared to what I'm used to seeing because you have two at the top and then, and then it multiplies in there. This just kind of blows up immediately. Um, and so first off, the uh, oval shapes are females and the rectangular shapes are males. Uh, and if you follow those lines down to where they meet, that's where those pairs are mating. And from there you get the, uh, the, the cubs from that. Um, and you do that for each of those mates and follow it down to the next next level there. Um, so on the top you have those first generation mates, so Pluto and the seven, the seven females that he mates with. Uh, and then their offspring are the second generation cubs, their offspring are the third generation grand cubs, and then the fourth generation great grand cubs come after them. I didn't get to those, so we didn't get to see those, those last few, but we'll talk about those first three generations in depth. Uh, we'll look at the, the lines from each of those females here. So starting here with Pluto and the mates, here we are at Flathead Lake Brewing Company. And hopefully this video works and tabs around. Um, and so we start out here. And if we're on top of things, which doesn't seem like we are, um, in a second, let's see if tabs around. Productive had 
four different mates and some Graham Cubs uh, for Ronan. And they also, uh, they also are really scattered across the ecosystem. So you can see how these genes start to move, right? We start in a locality and all of a sudden, every step, every generation, they start to move further and further away. And now Loco's family, Loco had two cubs with uh, Ludo, Skunk, and Kakashi, um, in that second generation there. And we see that Skunk went over to the scapegoat. Didn't like mom, had to get out of the house, I don't know. Um, and then Kakashi mated with Elk near home and had uh, one grand cub for Loco uh, named Slyvig. Right there, in this one. <clears throat> on to Tango's family, another mate of Pluto's. Uh, Tango only had one daughter, Pluto, Sharon. And then Sharon uh, mated with two different bears. Sharon stuck pretty close to her mom. Um, and, and then mated with two male bears and had uh, Gravel and Ann. Uh, gravel headed across the highway, Ann stuck pretty close. Colleen, one more, um, had just two generation family here. Uh, Colleen made it with Pluto and had Nab. Um, Nab also stayed pretty close as a male. Once again, by that rectangle, you can tell. Um, and then another unknown female. So one we didn't sample, but was in, in the uh, population based on the genetics. Uh, that unknown female had Helen, who moved over uh, toward the South Fork. And then Helen had a few cubs, and they stuck around by her. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, Tilly, Rampart, and Lou, it looks like. I mean, these are average locations for those bears. So Rampart, we caught quite a few times, something like 40 times, I believe, and he was all over the place. He was quite the mover. Uh, and then the last of the seven mates, uh, Sappho. Um, <laughs> this is an interesting relationship. Sappho and Pluto had six cubs together. So that's, that's a lot of cubs for one pairing. Um, so they, at a minimum, mated twice, and if not, more likely three or four times, four seven times. So that's, that's over a span of eight, 10, 12 years. Um, they had six cubs that scattered throughout the swan. Swan Mountains, and then those cubs had quite a few grand cubs themselves. Um, and that that also really just blows up. So the genetic, genetic material is still being uh, spread throughout the ecosystem there. Most of them stay close, especially females. Female grizzly bears tend to stay close to their mothers. Males tend to tend to venture out. Um, and here you see Ace, uh, a male went went northeast, and a name that got cut off, Vinx. Vinx headed southwest, so they kind of split in opposite directions, um, spreading that genetic material. And so just kind of an overview now how those genes spread. Uh, we'll focus in on that, that first core, the first generation, head to the second generation, and then the third generation. So here we go to Budo and the, the seven female mates, that first generation, kind of all clustered around uh, missions uh, and swan. <clears throat> um, and then you look at their offspring all of their offspring this time. So there are 17 of them here uh, that, that uh, Pluto and the, the seven mates had. Um, they scatter a bit. Zoom out. Um, and then we see what those 17 offspring did. Um, and so those 17 cubs then turned into uh, quite a few more grand cubs, right? And all of a sudden, Pluto has uh, has genetic material in every single corner of the ecosystem, right? He's, he's in the southwest, the southeast. Uh, has two bears up in Glacier National Park, and uh, sorry, two two grand cubs up in Glacier, and also two up in Whitefish, the Whitefish Range. Um, and so you can see how that this can actually just really spread very quickly. This is, this is just three generations we're looking at here. Um, and so now I'll, I'll hand it over to Tab uh, for the rest of it. Put my ear down. If, if anybody else needs a beer, you should.
should make sure to flag people down. Okay, so um, this is, yeah, this is uh, pretty exciting to be able to take a look at it. It's pretty exciting to realize just that we have this level of connectivity or have had this level of connectivity um, in the system. I want to do, um, uh, just get in a little bit deeper. Okay, there. So, so what we're, this area we were talking about then is this southwest portion, you know, so this is where we had a relatively low level of genetic diversity back in 2004. And um, this is sort of the, just the dots that uh, Nate just showed you, but uh, just the center points. Um, but I wanted to go back to, so what does this mean ecologically? Um, and, and so basically this means that we have a really strong understanding of why there was really low genetic diversity there in 2004. So this one individual contributed a lot of genes in this population. Um, and in fact, when we counted all, up all of the individuals just, just during our 2004 sampling period, um, almost half of the population it, you know, in that sub area was related to Pluto. So that's um, a lot of related individuals. Um, and so it's a good thing some of them moved out. <laughs> but but why did that then, we can also use this in, in the kinds of data that Nate just showed you to look at, so why did that genetic diversity increase? And what we saw is that not only were um, other individuals moving out of the area, but we also had individuals moving into the area. And that's really what's responsible for that big increase in genetic diversity, is all of those individuals moving back into the area. And in this area, was in this um, region, it wasn't very much in terms of the long distance migrants, so some of those really long movements, um, but it's enough to, so we had a lot of short distance movements as well, so. Um, the southeast, we saw exactly the same kind of pattern. We had one individual there, um, a male again, who actually we detected 101 descendants of. So in the southeast, uh, or southwest, it was 61, and in this area it was 101. And so um, really this just illustrates that uh, without this genetic data, we wouldn't have been able to understand what was going on. And this has implications not just for this population, which at this point is doing pretty well, um, but for other recovered populations that might have had these sort of uh, isolated groups that I was talking about before. So um, people do theoretical simulations and try to understand what happens, and they sort of think, well, if you get if you get populations connected, if you get movement into there, um, it's going to be a good thing, and you're going to be able to increase your genetic diversity. This is one of the few cases where we can actually show that that's what happened. Um, this is really, I mean, I, I keep saying it's an incredible data set. I feel so fortunate to be able to work with it and be able to work on this species, but it, it really, really is. So, um, yeah, and so in this area, we saw the same kind of pattern um, where we also had a lot of migration into it. And um, I didn't put in slides for the for the other, the third sort of region, but that one, we, we did not find these dominant, a dominant individual, but we did find a lot of movement into it. So, um, pretty interesting to be able to dive in. So, um, yeah, basically just to sum that up, I just wanted to sort of reiterate, you know, we, this, this really large uh, long-term data set where we've been able to sample across time is really the only thing that has allowed us to look at this and to see that we've had this really rapid increase in genetic diversity um, and being able to analyze it then at this fine scale that we were able to do. Um, so it opens a lot of options in terms of thinking about management and how do you monitor in the future and as you decide that, how do you want to think about, you know, what uh, what level of information do you want? Like this is pretty fine scale, um, but that gives you a lot of information in terms of what you do as well, in terms of uh, population management and habitat management. Um, so this is just kind of recaps of the same things we were talking about. The, we have genetic diversity increasing in the south, that's a good thing. Um, this We have this pattern of a couple, uh, a few individuals having a really strong impact on the population. Um, we also have reproductive success varying by density, so lower, lower density means you have higher numbers of offspring. Um, and the main thing that I think is really important is that we have had connectivity in the system and uh, that's really responsible for increasing diversity. So um, that's been exciting. So um, we've got more stuff, but I don't know how far along we are. Before I get into that, I want to want to make sure that I acknowledge all the people that contributed to the study and all of the partners. With this kind
kind of huge data set. We have to have a lot of partners and a whole bunch of agencies were really involved in this. Um, this analysis was made possible by the Glacier National Park Conservancy um, and uh, a number of other things. But there's a lot of people involved in it. In fact, I should ask him, did any of you help collect data? Because I rarely get to give a talk where there's not at least one person who will collect some of our fair hair. Nobody in this room. Okay, there's another room. It's, it's totally possible. I collected, I collected some of the hair, but um, yeah, okay. Um, so let's see. So what time is it? We look. So 6.51. So I don't know. Where's the... Oh, they're, they're not here right now. I'm trying to decide if I should go more or should I let people ask. I'll let people ask questions. Go ahead. So... Part of that last part, so my son and his wife spent a lot of time in the glacier mm -hmm. in back country. Are you looking for volunteers to collect data? Um, not at the moment. Um, so uh, where we're at right now is, what's that? Oh, I have to repeat the question. Um, so uh, he asked whether we're looking for volunteers to help collect data right now. Um, so at the moment, we're not collecting bare hair. Um, what's been going on since, uh, really since we started well, about since 2004, is that there's been two projects kind of trying to understand where the population's going. And that's been a really important for management reasons because um, they're considering, you know, is this population recovered? Fish and Wildlife Service is trying to decide should they be listed? Um, all of those kinds of things. Um, and so managers in the whole group have been very interested in knowing if the population's going up and down and trying to figure out how to monitor them. So there's been two projects. There's been one led by the uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and they've been using uh, captured bear data to look at uh, female survival and use that as a method. And then we were testing out this method. And so we're now at this juncture where we're just getting the results back from what's happening, and we're finding out that they're both consistent, and then both methods are saying this bear population is increasing. Um, and it will be a matter of uh, all of the managers in the system trying to decide what, what do they want to do going forward. And um, at that point, we'll, we'll be able to know whether we're going to do some more hair sampling, um, or whether there's some other questions, that kind of thing. So it was a long, really long answer to your question. <laughs> um, I'm going to take one over here, and then if others, go ahead. Um, number one, my elevate down is Lois Lake and Big Park does collect. Yes. Lois, yeah. Yeah, Lois was a great help in the project. Yeah, and she's been doing it for a long time. And she has. And she has. And helps me collect data. Yeah. But um, where are you guys working out of? Um, so we're stationed up in West Glacier, um, in Glacier National Park. So um, we have a, the USGS uh, Glacier Field Station is what we're called, and there's uh, three different lead scientists there. So myself, who's a terrestrial ecologist, uh, we have Clinton Wolfeld, who's a um, fish biologist, aquatic biologist, and we have Dan Pagri, who works on uh, glaciers. So. so you're in West Glacier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But we, um, one of the nice things in terms of that I think is exciting about being part of US. USGS is that uh, the projects that we work on are not necessarily confined to our place. So it's really easy for us to work on uh, these interjurisdictional questions, large landscape questions. I mean, that's, I, I consider myself to be a spatial wildlife ecologist, and so, um, so I like working on large landscapes, so <laughs> that makes me very happy. But I, I mean, I also have a, a project down in uh, Grand Canyon National Park, for example, that's with a big one sheep, so I mean, I want to uh, work where down in near Kimmerer, Wyoming on elk that, that needs working with to, to help animals that do so. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. What was the question? And what about Oh, she had just asked where we were out of. That was that question. And what about hunting? Hunting. Oh, and uh, so this question is, is what about hunting? Um, uh, so right now there's no hunting in the system. Um, the if so the way where we're at in terms of the endangered species act listing of this population of being as being threatened is that um there's a draft conservation strategy that is basically the guiding document to say how will bears be managed if they are delisted um and there's several agents that relies on several uh, different agency documents that describe the protections of uh, 
bearers in terms of things like how is their habitat to be managed. Um, if there is, if Fish, Wild, and Parks does want to hunt, what is the framework that they'll use to determine the number of bears that they hunt, all of those kinds of things. And so right now there's a draft conservation strategy. People have commented on it. And um, basically Fish and Wildlife Service is now focused on Yellowstone. And so basically not that much has happened in terms of uh, any Fish and Wildlife Service um, movement forward, either on addressing the comments in the conservation strategy or in making any kind of proposed uh, delisting. Um, what we're expecting to happen is that they'll come back to that after they're kind of finished with Yellowstone. And so right now, in terms of regulatory mechanisms, the things that are going on are um, things like the Forest Service Plan, where they're describing how they're going to be managing the land. Um, and at some point, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service will come back to that conservation strategy. Does that does that answer your question? At least give me the background. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what will happen. Maybe that's the best uh, overall short sure answer. Um, okay, I'll let you go. Oh, they do mine. Got it. So that was region four that you were mainly talking about, right? Um, so the the pictures that we were showing in terms of diving down were basically based out of the missions, right. but this whole it's this whole ecosystem, and so that it covers. Uh, I don't know if I know the number. I don't know if I remember all the numbers for Fish Wildlife Parks, but it's Region One, Region Four, and I think Region Two at so least. The question is, is, do you see Yellowstone bears or other region bears coming into Region Four? No. Oh. Not yet. So, um, so well, I don't know about where the region four boundaries are. But so, what we're seeing though is that our population is expanding south, and the Yellowstone population is expanding north. And so, I think um, you know there, there's, there were some sightings this last summer that were uh, further south than we have detected before, and those were documented with pictures. And so, there's not necessarily any genetic data from them. When we do have genetic data, we can do what's called an assignment test and basically figure out are they from this system, from the NTBE, or from Yellowstone. But uh, th those those ones that I know that were closest towards Yellowstone, but still closer to this system, we didn't have any genetic samples, so we couldn't assign them. So but I think the closest they're at now is about 70 miles apart. So. so the other part of that question is, I've always assumed that the more remote areas had a higher density. Is that not true? Um, not that, consistently across the system. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, thanks for reminding me. Um, so he asked, the second question he asked was about uh, whether the more remote areas have higher densities of bears. And um, so that's true in the northern part of our system, which is Glacier National Park. And of course they've had a huge number of protections. They stopped hunting bears there much earlier than the rest of the system. Um, we actually, the, the density, I didn't put those in here, but the, the most, because uh, a lot of that's preliminary still, but the, the density maps that we have from our newest results um, are basically, they're, they're sort of, it's sort of patchy. Um, so in, the mob doesn't have more density? It's, it's getting higher, so the density is increasing, um, but it's not equally dense everywhere. So in 2004, um, it was something like half of the bears were in the northern third of the system. Um, and since then, that, that distribution has changed quite a bit. So, okay. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, as a scientist, one or both of you can talk about the upside and downside of the risk. Um, okay, so the question is, as a scientist, whether we can talk about the upside or downside of um, we should applaud that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah, it is. It's wonderful. And um, the so as a USGS employee, so I'm a federal employee, um, my job is to provide science, and it's not to uh, state one way or the other. Um, you know what what should be done in terms of delisting. I think you know in general, at some level. Um, 
the science points to this population having met all of the recovery criteria in terms of that 1993 recovery plan. I don't see anything, I don't see any data that makes me concerned about where this population is at right now. All of the indications are that the population is growing and that everything's been going quite well for it. Um, so in terms of delisting then, that becomes a value-based political decision that uh, will have to be this negotiation between a lot of different agencies and of course the public as well. Um, and there's a lot of different things to consider for that. And I guess, uh, maybe I didn't quite frame it right, I'm more curious about as, as the work that you do, is there, it seems like the listing has a downside to be able to get the funding, the studies, the research and stuff that you're going, but I'm wondering if there is an upside as well to the working scientists in the field trying to study this population. Does it become easier for the Bears to get the listing? That's an interesting question too. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that because that's it's sort of untrod territory in a lot of ways. Um, so oh, yes, thank, you, thank you for reminding me. I appreciate that. So she asked um, about what will happen to basically what will happen to the funding for grizzly bear research uh, if delisting happens, and what does that mean for being able to do science? Um, I think for for grizzly bears, they're definitely a, what's called a conservation reliant species, and that means that um, their things like their reproductive rates are relatively slow. Um, we don't expect, they're very different from say wolves where they have a very high reproductive rate. And so I think all of the agencies are anticipating that there will have to be some level of continued research and monitoring that's done in order to be able to manage um, grizzly bears in the, in the future here. Um, I don't know what that means for my particular uh, research program, of course, and, and how that all fits together. But it's, it's a good question. What I'm wondering the answer to myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, in the middle. I was curious, is there an inverse relationship between population density and genetic diversity? So for instance, in the missions, there's less density, but they're native across the mother, mother, daughter. Is that a pattern that holds true? Or? Um, yeah, so, so she asked whether is there what the relationship is between density and diversity and so yeah what we see what we saw so far is that in those areas that had low diversity those are also the areas that had lower density to start off with um, and again we're, we're seeing that shift through time and we're actually just that we've just created the very first density surfaces like literally uh, two weeks ago and so it's not published yet it's not it still has to undergo a pretty rigorous review process, but we are, um, it's one of the things that we're interested in exploring further. But in, in general, in a very broad sense, we do see that lower density has lower diversity as well. But, but part of that's the historical piece, and so it's, it's not always straightforward. Um, so if we were, if the population were to take a, a big dive in the short term, um, the diversity might still look okay for a, at least a generation or two. So. So, so I, I wonder about, uh, as, as your project goes on and as you gather more data over the years, um, can you tell something about the health of individual bears and, and uh, maybe the mortality rates um, associated with certain bears and where they're living and what the diversity is in that area and things like that? Um, okay, so this question, I'll start with this question and try to reframe that, so, or, or restate it. Uh, so he's, you're asking about, can we tell um, much about the health of the bears and also mortality rates from this kind of data? Is that yeah. fair? Okay. Yeah. And so, um, with, so if we do another year of sampling, we will be able to look at what the overall survival rate of bears is between one time period and the next. So yes, we can get that data from, from this genetic kind of sampling. In terms of the health of the bears, um, we, we don't handle the actual bears when we're just doing, if you only do genetic sampling. And so from that, um, you can look at, you can look at the hairs and break down what they're eating in a very broad sense. Um, you can look, um, there's, there's some new techniques that are still being evaluated to look at sort of hormone levels and things like that. Um, I don't think they're at the point of looking at really being able to describe that as, as health or not. We might be able to in the future be able to 
called reproductive status. Um, and so I think part of uh, what I think is really important in terms of thinking about how this population is monitored in the future is that so far people have looked at, you know, we've looked at sort of monitoring them via these rub trees by themselves, and then we've looked at monitoring them via just captured bears. And what we haven't done, and what I think is really the next frontier, is thinking about can we combine those data, and is there maybe a way that we could be able to put all of those things together in some sort of um, regular fashion to get the most of that work. The best, <laughs> let me try to get the best of both worlds. <laughs> so, so we might be able to um, get more age data directly from uh, handling bears, but we might be able to get a larger number of bears from this method. Is that, is that where you were going with that? I guess I, I sort of wondered yeah. about the, uh, you know, there, there's been, I don't know if it's a myth or if it's real, but um, with low diversity, there are bears mating with their first cousins. Yeah. Um, and and does, does that, does, is there some way to determining how, how the health of the population depends on some of the diversity? That, that you have to have a diverse population and a healthy population, and how that helps us tell whether we're close enough to a situation where we can can do a delisting kind of a thing, or whether we need to keep going in order to make sure we have a healthy population. Okay, so I, now I get where you're going. Okay, so he was trying to ask about um, whether the levels of diversity, uh, is there some way of looking at the level of diversity and saying, well, that's an unhealthy level of diversity, and that might mean that the, the bears themselves aren't that healthy. Um, so that's a complicated question as well. So there's not real benchmark numbers for this level of, it's called observed heterozygosity, is the level at which uh, grizzly bears, or really most other species, have problems. Um, what we do know about bears in general is that the overall levels that we have here, and even in those lower diversity areas, are not that low. Um, so they're uh, point in the in the upper point sixes, upper point sevens. Um, even our low numbers are kind of comparable to what's going on in Yellowstone, and they're much higher. They're almost they're over double what the bears in Kodiak have. And when you look at the bears in Kodiak, we have not detected any obvious genetic um, problems. So you know, like. Uh, Florida panthers, for instance, they were getting a kink tail, and then they were also having lower reproduction and things like that that were really um, obvious. And we haven't seen that even in even in bears with less than half of the genetic diversity that we have in this system. So I hope that does a better job. Mary. Can you uh, speak to the importance of the connectivity with Canada? Did your study look at that? That's a great, yeah. So she asked about um, the connectivity of our bears with the Canadian bears and whether we looked at that. Um, so most of what we showed you here is version one, I call it, of the family tree. Um, so th that included mostly just the, well, entirely just the hair samples from the hair sampling efforts that, that I talked about. Version two of the family tree included the Canadian bears. Um, and so that was really fun. We, we did that, uh, that one took three months to run. So adding, uh, brought us up to about two, almost 2,000 bears. And we used that to look at, um, with our Canadian partners, um, whether, female, whether bears pass down conflict behavior. Um, so basically trying to ask whether that was passed genetically or whether that was passed through social learning. So because young bears stay with their moms for a couple years, you might expect, everybody thinks that that's what happens, is that um, moms can teach their cubs uh, good behavior or bad behavior. And we did find an effect of that. And so um, it really suggested that these Young, uh, young bears um, probably, that, it, that it's really, really important to do this mitigation, the, all the mitigation that the managers do to try to keep especially female bears from getting into trouble in the first place. So, um, so great question. And now we're doing version three. Um, and version three is incorporating all of the captured bears, not all the handled bears in the system. And so um, we are doing what I was just talking about in terms of bringing all that, those data sets together. And the first piece of that is redoing this family tree to be able to look at all kinds of questions um, with that data set. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll come back to you. You mentioned uh, 
U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, U.S. Forest Service. How many agencies are using your service, your studies, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're in a holding pattern as these agencies sort of figure out what to do with this data. Is that right? Um, so there's a lot of different agencies. So those, the, the agencies I've mentioned so far are the people that are major, mostly major land owners. So of course, Fletcher National Park is also a big part of that. Um, the two tribes that are the two uh, reservations with uh, its four tribes all together um, are also considered to be uh, local land managers. And so that's the Confederated Salish Treaty Tribe and the Blackfeet Tribe. Um, we also have a, a DNRC. Um, people that are part of the, the system. But basically, the, the system, all of the kind of um, conservation uh, activities that happen at that system-wide level, including thinking about the conservation strategy, um, includes all of the all of those agencies that have land, um, and as well as USGS as a science advisor. So, um, that was the, so that was the question was, sorry, I forgot the question, but basically it was, um, who are the people that are using this data? And then the second piece of that is whether we're in a holding pattern while um, delisting decisions are in progress. Um, so um, I, I have a I have a job to do, and that's to work on work on science questions in the system. So um, right now, what we're working on is is uh, working on this uh, renew the, the version three of the family tree data. So we still have plenty to do, um, and we're also looking at some of these other exciting questions. So I mentioned dispersal early on, and I've shown you just a few things about dispersal. Um, one of the other things I'm really excited to do is to take those results um, and actually make a map where we look at uh, what landscape features sort of are more likely to improve dispersal versus inhibit dispersal. And so that's a definite direction that, that I'm going in in terms of the research on grizzly bears that we're doing. So, and there's others too. We're also looking at um, another one that we're in progress on is looking at how something called, this is, I hope this isn't too technical, but there's something called effective population size. And that's basically another potential way of monitoring population size um, where you basically just look at these uh, the genotypes themselves. So you, don't, you might not need as high of a sample size in order to be able to tell if the population is going up or down. But we're just at the beginning stages of that too. I'm sorry, your landscape dispersal is that natural, man-made both? Yeah, and so one of the great things about, um, oh yeah, thank you. Um, she asked about whether uh, the dispersal that we're talking about is natural, man-made, or both. And um, so one of the things from this data set and what I showed you here, what we showed you here, is that we know that there's this movement of genes. We don't always know whether that's a natural movement or not. And so um, in this population, as uh, people have been managing bears to get them out of complex situations in some cases, um, there have been quite a few movements of bears um, that were made uh, in, a in a truck, basically. Um, most of the time when, when that happens, the bears go right back to where they came from, even when it's a really long distance away. But um, that's not to say that some of those movements that we showed you could not have been made in a truck. And so in combining our data with the state's data and the other partners' data, um, we'll be able to tease that out directly and make sure that in our uh, dispersal analysis, we don't include any non-natural dispersals. So. Um, there was somebody in the back that I yeah, Following up on the Canadian bears, the, the northern continental appears to have the greatest population, the greatest density of prison bears. Do you have any feelings on what proportion of that would be transient bears from Canada? And then, second question uh, you're thinking about delisting in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And we're not thinking about you this in the northern continental ecosystem, even though we're marking the affairs. Why is that? Okay, so the first question is how many bears went back and forth to Canada? Um, and we haven't looked, there's, there's so many, this is such a rich data set that 
we haven't, there's a lot of things we haven't looked at yet. Um, what I can tell you is that um, the, the, the uh, project I talked about before with the conflict behaviors is uh, the, the lead author on that is our Canadian partner up in Alberta, um, Andrea Morehouse. And uh, she approached us about working with us on this. She, she'd written, so she's just finished her PhD, and she'd written into her proposal to look at a family tree of bears. But when she got her initial data set back, she realized that over half of her bears were either in British Columbia or in Montana, um, because we all use the same genetics lab. So um, he was like, you need to go talk to your uh, neighbors. And um, so, so we know there's quite a bit of movement, but we haven't quantified that really directly. And let's see, the second part of your question was, Oh. Yeah, so the second part was uh, why are they focusing on delisting in Yellowstone um, and not doing that here first? So Fish and, this is a Fish and Wildlife Service. They, they are the agency that has the um, authority to list and delist bears, and they have made the choice to um, work on Yellowstone, I would say first, but, but they have been making a lot of steps yeah. to um, understand what's going on in this population up here and I wouldn't say that they haven't been doing anything they just haven't been doing anything in the last you know year while they've been focusing on Yellowstone and it's not that they haven't been doing anything it's just not anything very visible or obvious it's a very slow process up here um, but again I, I would anticipate that to change once they get through some of these um, processes with Yellowstone so as the population of Montana increases and the population of grizzlies increase, when my ancestors came here in 1864, grizzly bears were all over the state of Montana. Um, they gradually got pushed back into the mountainous regions, but now they're moving back into the High Plains area. So the question is, are you studying that movement into the plains? And what's going to be done about the human interaction with grizzly bears? I mean, it seems from a novice point of view that it seems to be increasing. Um, I grew up down outside of Yellowstone. Um, so we used to see bears all the time up there. But uh, you know, is that going to happen as the whole population increase? Is there going to be more conflict between humans and grizzly bears? Yeah, so, um, so the question was uh, referring back to more historical times and, and where grizzly bears, grizzly bears had a much broader distribution and uh, were way out on the plains. And the comment also was that now they are becoming more common on the plains and spreading back out there. Um, and so we asked first whether we're doing any research out there. So um, right now, the data sets that we're working with are the ones that I have shown you. Um, the state is, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is tracking those movements and recording those changes in distribution. And also working really hard along with a lot of um, partners, including a lot of nonprofit agencies, including Defenders of Wildlife, um, to try to proactively uh, address conflicts before they happen. And so um, when we, so we're, we've talked a lot about grizzly bears here at this level in Montana. Um, grizzly bears, their species name is Ursus arctos, and they are actually, they actually have a fairly broad distribution. They're in Russia, um, they're in Europe, um, of course they're in Alaska and Canada as well. And in some of these places, they're a lot more populated than we are here in, in Montana. Um, so the question of how many bears can a place have and how many conflicts are there is it's a pretty complicated one and it's it will depend a lot on how we do as managers and as citizens um, in terms of keeping all of our attractants clean and living safely in bear country and giving bears the space that they need to be able to live. So um, it's, it's, it's a complex question, but I, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do that. So you talk about the Kodiak grizzly in Alaska briefly. Isn't Abbey Island the highest concentration of the grizzly bears? And how do we compare, how does the glacier region compare to the uh, So the follow-up question there was about uh, 
what the if whether Admiralty Island has the highest density of grizzly bears and how we compare it here to that density. Um, and I actually don't have those numbers with me, so so I can't give you a good answer on that. Um, it, I'm sh I know we have did sort of overall density estimates from up there, but I don't know if they are. So you've done some research on the Um I haven't personally, but uh, yeah, it's a uh, there's there's a lot of bear researchers out there. So. And they're pretty famous because of their size. So. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they eat a lot of fish, and the, whenever um, bears have more protein, they tend to be larger in size. So. Okay, any other questions? One more? Or are we done? Okay, maybe I'll take questions at the, uh, on a... I think this will be the last Oh, one more? Okay, all right, one more. Go ahead. Maybe you already answered this, but does Pluto somehow know not to mess around with this <laughs> Can I take that one, Nate? So the question was, does Pluto somehow know not to mess around with his daughter? Um, no. no, I don't know. Uh, there are there are bears elsewhere in the system that do mess around with their daughters. So uh, maybe there's a tent. Maybe they don't know. I don't, and there, there's there's really no way of telling uh, from this data set. <laughs> Thanks again. We'll see you next time on Sunday.